This is the session on Snowflake Differential Privacy, where we'll be talking about how to unlock insights on your most sensitive data. My name is Sam Chang, and I'm a product manager here at Snowflake, uh, and I focus on Snowflake's data privacy features. So as I mentioned today, I'll be speaking on differential privacy. Uh, it's a new feature that we're announcing that enables you to share the most sensitive data. I'll be starting with uh, the opportunity. What, what is there for us to gain by sharing sensitive data? I'll move into why we need differential privacy, uh, talk a little bit about how differential privacy appears in Snowflake, and then we'll wrap things up with a product demo. So let's start with the opportunity. What are we trying to do with private data and data privacy? To consider this, let's think about what we can do with sensitive data. Sensitive data exists in all industries. Sensitive data doesn't just uh, refer to personal information. It can also refer to proprietary information or trade secrets. This is just a small sampling of industries and use cases that have sensitive data. And if we could unlock this sensitive data, we could do all of these use cases and unlock significant value for the business. However, because the data is sensitive, privacy requirements often get in the way. Because of the privacy requirements, data owners don't often get the full value out of their sensitive data. And in most cases, the sensitive data is not even used at all. If we could solve the privacy requirements, we could unlock so much value and so many use cases using the sensitive data. And that's exactly how Snowflake thinks about data privacy. Data privacy is a pillar under Snowflake Horizon. And with data privacy, what we want to do is help you unlock your sensitive data while protecting data subjects. The way we do this is with our portfolio of privacy technologies. This portfolio covers the full spectrum of privacy requirements, ranging from low stakes, simple use cases, for example, internal sharing, all the way to high stakes, high privacy cases, for example, sharing externally or even data monetization. Today, I'll be focused on the right-hand side of this spectrum, where, as I mentioned, uh, these use cases are uh, higher complexity, higher stakes, um, and historically have been more challenging to solve. So while the privacy uh, requirements for these use cases are more complex uh, and the stakes are higher, what is exciting about these use cases is that the opportunity is also much higher. If we can solve the requirements here on the left, we can unlock new use cases like data monetization, cross-border analytics, and private data release. These are use cases that can't fully be solved without a solution for strong privacy. The technology that solves these high-value, high-privacy use cases is differential privacy. Differential privacy is a technology that was innovated from data privacy research to meet stringent requirements for analytics and reporting on sensitive data. Outside of the research space, it's used extensively by large tech companies, for example, Google, Apple, Amazon, as well as by organizations to share data under privacy regulations like GDPR and HIPAA. Before I get into the details of how differential privacy works, let's first understand why we need a specific technology to solve these high privacy use cases. To do this, we'll look at an example of such a high privacy use case and why it is not solved by other privacy solutions. So let's consider Shipco. So Shipco is a shipping company, uh, and this company helps their customers ship products around the world. What they do is they receive delivery orders on behalf uh, of their customers' consumers, and they fulfill these deliveries uh, and keep track of all of the deliveries data. So they sit on a wealth of sensitive data um, that show you know, what products are being shipped, how much, and when. So for this data, let's start with the basic use case. So in this use case, uh, let's say Shipco's customers want to understand patterns uh, in their own data, and they want to understand uh, customer demand for their own products. Well, Shipco can easily do this by partitioning their data with Roaccess policies and saying, OK, customer A, you get customer A's data. Customer B, you get customer B's data. Customer A, you cannot get customer B's data. Right? Super simple, super easy. There's very clear lines we can draw in the data that delineate which parts of the data should go to whom. However, as I mentioned, this is a basic use case. The full value of the data is not unlocked here. Shipco has delivery records across many, many customers. And what we can do with this data is unlock a lot more for our customers and help them understand not only the demand and the trends for their own products, but also across product categories and across customers. And this is what we call the benchmarking use case. With this use case, uh, instead of customer A gets customer A's data, what we want to do is customer A can understand insights and trends across customers A, B, C, D, and so on whether it's all customers, all customers within a product category, or whatever customer A wants to see. However, Shipco must ensure that 
their customer's data is protected, right? What we don't want is customer A to learn specific information about customer B, because in this case, customer B could be a competitor. So in this case, there aren't clear lines that we can draw in the data that say, okay, customer A, this data goes here, customer B, this data goes here. So what is the solution? Let's try to solve this using what I call privacy rules. A privacy rule is, for example, a heuristic approach um, that says, in this case, for example, an aggregate must have at least 30 customers uh, or the, uh, that aggregate will be blocked. This kind of privacy rule is put in place to try to make sure that the data consumer is not filtering down too granularly in the data set so that they're not saying, okay, let's filter down to customer B's information and then grab that and run off with it. So here I'm gonna use two privacy rules. As I mentioned, I'm going to use the aggregation rule. And then the second one I'm going to do is masking. In addition to the aggregation rule, I'm also going to mask identifying fields. In this case, as you can see here on the left, what I've done is I've masked the address field. In this case, the address field could be very identifying because in some cases, the ship code customer could want to ship directly to a specific retail location. So I'm just gonna mask that out. So let's see how these two privacy rules perform in this use case. If we take a closer look, what we find is actually they're not a really a good fit. The first reason is that they decrease the value of the data. So as a super simple example, because we've masked the address field, the data consumer can now no longer do geography-based analyses. And if we go back to the business context, this is key, right? Uh, if you're customer A, you wanna understand how your products are performing within your local market. If you've grown by 10%, but the local market has grown by 50, you're not doing too well. But in this case, customer A can't understand this because they can't access the address field. The second key issue here is that the data's not very private still, right? So we implemented two different privacy rules, again, masking and aggregation. But there are still privacy attacks that you can still do on the data to discover specific information about customers. So in this case, I've illustrated one such example of a privacy attack that is called a differencing attack. So with the differencing attack, what we wanna do is compare two different results that differ on a small number of customers, potentially just one customer. So as an example here, I've done analysis by week, and I've seen that going from week one to week two, the number of customers delivering this specific product, the difference is only one. In this case, the number of customers has exceeded my threshold of 30, so I can get results to these queries. They weren't blocked by the privacy rules. However, because these two results differ by just one customer, I can immediately tell, oh, well, there's new, one new customer who entered this space and they're delivering this specific product. And if we take the difference between the, the volume of products, most of that is probably attributable to this one new customer. This kind of information is easily correlatable to real life news. Um, and we have found in many cases that this is not at all acceptable from a privacy standpoint. So at this point you might ask, do we really expect privacy attacks on this data? In this case, let's again go back to the business context and remember that this is highly competitive information. In this case, yes, we absolutely do expect privacy attacks because you know, customer A absolutely wants to learn sensitive information about customer B. That would give them a competitive edge. So in this case, we do need to consider privacy attacks and we do need to protect against, for example, differencing attacks. So what is the solution to all of this? Bit of a spoiler, differential privacy is the solution. So now that we've seen this motivating use case, let's get into uh, what differential privacy is and how it would solve the utility and privacy problems in, the, in the, this use case. So differential privacy in Snowflake is built as a policy. You're probably familiar with masking policies or access policies. It's built on the same framework. There's two key mechanisms that underpin differential privacy. The first is noise. So in order to protect privacy, when data is protected by a differential privacy policy, there will be noise dynamically added to each query result. When I say dynamic, what I mean is when a query is less sensitive, the amount of noise would be lower, and the query, when the query is more sensitive, the noise would be larger. The second mechanism is privacy budget, and this is what protects against privacy attacks that occur over multiple queries. Let's get a little bit deeper on how each of these mechanisms works and how each of these protects privacy. Let's first consider noise. So here I have two examples. On the left-hand side, as I mentioned before, if we have a query that is not very sensitive, the amount of noise is low. So for example, in this case, I'm asking, what's the average quantity of shipments of product A per customer, right? This is an analysis that is cutting across all customers, 
And so it's very easy to protect the privacy of one customer out of my entire universe of customers. So in this case, query is not very sensitive, and as you can see, the noise is very low. The way we can tell this is that Snowflake, in addition to returning the noisy result, will also return what we call a lower and upper bound um, on the differentially private result. What this means is that the true value most likely lies between this lower and upper bound. What we can do is look at the distance between the lower and upper bound and see that it is very narrow compared to the result itself, so we can tell that the amount of noise is very low. On the other hand, if we do a very sensitive query, for example, in this case, I'm asking how many customers ordered products B, E, H, T, I'm essentially filtering down uh, to one customer who I know ships this specific combination of products. In this case, the exact answer is one. This is not something we want to return to analysts. Instead, Snowflake will differential privacy will return something like three, where the lower bound is zero and the upper bound is 21. In this case, if we look at the distance between the lower bound and the upper bound, what we'll notice is that width is very large compared to the noisy answer of three. Not only that, we'll notice that the lower bound includes zero. So I don't even know whether or not I found this customer in the data set. It could be that they just don't exist. So this is how adding noise dynamically to queries would protect against uh, sensitive queries. Going back to the specific example that we looked at with differencing attack, uh, let's see how noise would protect against this. So if you recall, to do the difference attack in the past, what I did was compare the number of customers in week one versus week two. In this case, with noise, it may look like the number of customers is still differing by one, going from week one to week two, but if we look at the ranges that are provided by Snowflake with differential privacy, we'll notice that we don't really have confidence that the number of customers has actually changed from week one to week two. And this is exactly what we wanted to do with differential privacy. No one result should be influenced by one customer. If it is, we can easily discover sensitive information about that one customer, and then methodically do that for all customers. So let's move on to the second mechanism, which is privacy budget. What we just saw with the previous privacy attacks uh, were attacks that occur over a small number of queries, right? Filtering down to one customer, that's one query. The difference in attack, that took two queries. There are many other privacy attacks that take place over a history of queries, and we need to protect against these. And this is why we have the privacy budget. With the privacy budget, we can quantify how much information is learned by the data consumer with every noisy query. And once we've quantified it, we can track that uh, and limit it so that the data consumer is not learning so much about the underlying data that they can eventually piece together some exact information using their query history. So at this point, you might say, okay, differential privacy, I'm convinced. Stronger privacy, I've seen how it protects against privacy attacks. But what did we give up in order to get that strong privacy? And this is the beauty of differential privacy. We actually get more out of the data with this stronger protection. To see this, let's again consider the data uh, on the left-hand side here. So just to be clear, the data on the left-hand side here would not be viewable by a data consumer, and this is just for us to visualize what it looks like. What you'll notice is that in this case, address is not masked. Previously, with privacy rules, I needed to mask address because it was an identifying field. In this case, with differential privacy, because noise is dynamically added to each query, I don't need to mask fields anymore. So I can expose the entire address field. What this enables data consumers to do is to do the geographic analyses that they wanted to do before, but it still prevents them from identifying individual customers by filtering down to specific addresses. So the two mechanisms that you just saw, noise and privacy budget, these are fundamental to differential privacy. As you can probably tell, there's a lot of complexity behind the scenes that we built to make it work. We realized this when designing differential privacy in Snowflake, so we decided to build an experience that's accessible to all customers, even if you don't have expertise in differential privacy. Compared to other implementations of differential privacy, Snowflake has specific innovations that make it easy to use, but still powerful and able to address complex use cases. These include support for arbitrary complex query patterns, as well as noise intervals to help data consumers understand how noisy a result is. Now that we've seen how differential privacy provides strong privacy protection, I want to bring us back to the specific privacy requirements we looked at in the beginning. As we saw in the benchmarking example, there are privacy requirements that aren't solved by privacy rules. Because differential privacy can protect against identification and privacy attacks, we can solve these privacy requirements on the left and unlock these cases on the right. 
I'll wrap up this overview by noting that differential privacy is available in two ways in Snowflake. The first way is built into Snowflake data cleanrooms. So in the data cleanroom, as you're setting it up, the data provider can easily choose to use differential privacy for specific templates. And the second way to use differential privacy is directly with the differential privacy policy. So with the policy, you have much more control, you can build for bespoke use cases, and you have access to a broader range of SQL functions and operations. All right, so with that overview, uh, let's move over to a demo. So in this demo, uh, I'm going to be showing it from two different perspectives. The first perspective is our data owner or our data provider. This is the person who is going to be configuring differential privacy. Uh, the second part of the demo, we're going to look at a data set protected by differential privacy from the perspective of a data consumer and, seeing, uh, and see what we can get out of it. Okay, so let's look first at the admin portion. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and run all of this and let it go in the background. So first, let's start with our sensitive data. So going back to the ship code use case, this is our deliveries data. As you can see, um, it's highly granular. Each row is one delivery, um, and we have information about where it's going. Uh, for simplicity, I instead of including a full address field, I went ahead and just parsed out the zip code. And we have information like which customer is delivering it, what's the product type, SKU, so on and so forth. In order to configure differential privacy, um, for this demo, uh, what I want to do actually is compare it to the privacy rules that we saw previously. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create uh, two different tables. One of them will be protected by differential privacy. That's this one called del deliveries diff priv. And the second one we will protect with our privacy rules. And that one is called deliveries priv rule. So just to confirm that these two tables were created correctly, uh, we're going to just see a sample of data again. Just a reminder, I'm doing this as the admin, so it's okay for me to see the sensitive data. Now that the data is set up, let's move on to defining the policy. So this is an example of what a differential privacy policy looks like. You'll probably notice that it looks very similar to other policies that you're used to in Snowflake. In this policy, what I'm saying is that if the current role is the account admin, that is the role that I'm currently using, then there's no privacy policy. What this means is that I can run exact queries, I'm going to get results back without any noise because I'm the privileged user. On the other hand, for all other users, what I'm going to return is this privacy budget object. When this is returned, Snowflake will recognize this and automatically create a privacy budget for you on the back end that it will use to track the information um, and that'll use to know to add noise dynamically to query results. What I've done here is say that the budget name for this privacy budget should be defined by the current user. What this means is that each user accessing this table will have their own privacy budget. All of this is flexible with Snowflake's RBAC controls. So in addition to current user, you could say things like current account, uh, you could say current role, and it gives you a lot of fine-grained control over how you dole out privacy budgets. So after defining this policy, uh, we're going to apply it to our table. So in this case, um, also very similar to other policies, we're going to alter the table and the privacy policy. And the new piece here is we're going to define an entity key. What the entity key is, is the column that denotes what is the sensitive entity in the data. So the sensitive entity is the data subject that you want to protect. Uh, in this case, uh, it is the combination of customer ID and product SKU. So what we're saying here is that we don't want anyone to be able to discover sensitive information about each combination of customer and product. All right, so that's the setup for differential privacy. There's a similar setup for privacy rules, so I won't get super deep into this. You're probably familiar with it already because it uses features that we've already released. So again, the aggregation policy as well as the masking policy. I'll go ahead and apply these to the other table that I created, deliveries priv rule, and then we'll be done with the, the privacy rule setup. The next step is privacy domains. So this is a new step for differential privacy. At a high level, the way I would think about this step is you're giving a data dictionary to data consumers to understand what is in the data. This is new for differential privacy because unlike with other privacy rules, uh, the data consumer can't see individual rows with data, right? So for example, if we're considering something like uh, a product name, 
right? Um, if, if I have Oreos, if someone is delivering Oreos in my data set, I don't know if the product name is all caps. I don't know if there's spaces in there. Uh, I don't know if it's Oreos dash family size, right? I can't inspect the data to see what I should be even filtering for. So with this, what it's saying is that the column product name has a domain, and that domain references the table itself. So what that's saying is that the unique values in this field product name are public knowledge. These should be shareable with the data consumer so the data consumer can then use these values and filter the data. So fields like product name, SKU, so on and so forth, these should get a privacy domain. But what you'll notice is that fields like customer ID, those don't get a privacy domain. These fields, ID fields in general, shouldn't be shared with the analyst, and they shouldn't be able to specifically filter on any one given customer ID. Um, so that's why we're not setting a privacy domain on it. Uh, in simple terms, you should be setting a privacy domain on fact and dimension columns. So after we've set this privacy domain, um, we're just gonna double check that it has been set properly. So we're gonna do a describe table, uh, and we see that the privacy domain uh, has been set for the fields that I wanted, um, and there's no privacy domain, for example, for our ID fields. After I've set up all the policies and applied them to the tables, I can then go ahead and grant select access to analysts. Uh, it's important to do this step after you've configured the policies and applied them. If you do it the other way around and grant select access first, there's a small window of time when the analysts have full access to the data without the policies. All right, we're done with our setup. Let's go ahead and test it to make sure it works. So if you'll recall in the policies that I defined before, what I said was that if you're the account admin, if the current user acquiring the data is the account admin, you're the privileged user, so you don't have the privacy policy or you don't have the aggregation policy. And that's exactly what we see here, right? So using the role account admin, I can still do a select star from this table and see the raw data. On the other hand, if I switch to the analyst rule, we can now see the policies uh, kick in action. So if I use the analyst rule and I try to do a select star, well, differential privacy is going to say, you can't do a select star because this is protected by differential privacy, right? If you recall, differential privacy adds noise to aggregate query results. Because differential privacy doesn't add noise to the data, there's no way to return a select star result that will still protect the privacy of our customers in this data set. Similarly, for the privacy rules, um, it'll also say that, hey, there's a policy violation because you're doing a select star, so you can't do this. So, so far, so good. The last test we'll do is see what happens when an analyst runs the query. So in this case, if I use the role analyst and I run a, an aggregate query, so in this case, I'm doing a count query, um, and I'm getting a result back on this table that is protected by differential privacy. If you notice, skipping ahead a little bit, uh, the result that I'm getting back with differential privacy is the same as the result that I'm getting back with the privacy rules that return exact results. And here you might be asking, okay, well, what's going on? Well, why am I getting the same result? Is differential privacy actually working here? So it is, and uh, this is Actually, the tricky thing about doing live demos, which is that uh, you can sometimes get results if your demo includes noise that may trip you up, but you have to keep in mind here that the first one um, has noise in it and the second one doesn't, and we'll see how the analyst will be able to actually tell that there's noise in this result in a little bit. Okay, so we've now validated our setup. Let's move on to the data consumer portion. So for the data consumer, um, what I've done is built a Streamlet app um, that shows the kinds of queries that a data consumer can run both against differential privacy um, and the privacy rules version of the table. So the first one I want to go to uh, is the syntax between differential privacy and privacy rules. Uh, as you saw in the admin's uh, testing example, the syntax is essentially the same, right? So between the table protected by differential privacy and the one protected by the privacy rule, there's not really a syntax difference. Right, your data consumers can query data protected by differential privacy in the same way and with the same syntax as they currently do with any other table. So in this case, if we look at the results now, now you'll notice that the results are different. So previously we had 4090 in both results. 
But here, because I've ran the query again with differential privacy, now we're seeing the noise added to the data. And if I go ahead and run this again, we should be able to see, yep, different results. So I mentioned that the data consumer can see how much noise is in the result, this result, um, and that is the uh, one new function uh, or a pair of functions that we're introducing with differential privacy. So in this case, to build on top of the previous query, uh, in addition to doing this count aggregate, what I'm going to say is I want to understand the lower and upper bound on this count aggregate, right? So I'm computing this aggregate, I'm defining an alias for this result, and then I'm passing that alias um, name into these two new functions, DP interval low and DP interval high. What that gets me uh, is this result. So it's going to say your private answer is 4091, and the true answer is most likely going to lie between 4085 and 4097. So the second example I want to show here is that noise is added dynamically, right? So uh, I have two examples here. The first example is going to be a query that is not very sensitive. So in this case, I could ask, what is the total of units of Oreos delivered in 2023? Um, and the answer it's going to give is you know, roughly 64 and a half million. With different privacy, again, we can also see the lower and upper bound. And we can see that the amount of noise relative to the total is not very high. If we compare this to privacy rules, so far, there's not much of a difference, right? With privacy rules, we get the exact result. Um, and with differential privacy, we get a result that is very, very close. However, if we go to a sensitive query, we can start seeing the differences between differential privacy and privacy rules. So if I ask a query like, what's the total units of moon pies delivered on a specific date? In this case, this could be a sensitive query because there's very few customers delivering this specific product on this specific date. We can see the effect of this on the results by looking at the lower and upper bound coming from differential privacy, which now you'll notice this range is very wide compared to the total units here. So here, the amount of noise is very large to protect this potentially very small number of customers who are delivering moon pies on this specific date. However, we're still getting a result back, right? We still get an estimate. We still get a range. We know that the answer is not zero, right? There, there's definitely some customers delivering unit moon pies on this specific date. However, if we look at the result that we would get through privacy rules, we notice that we don't get any result at all. And this is because, as you'll recall, we defined that aggregation rule that says if the number of customers is fewer than 30, this result is not returnable, right? So Snowflake, with the aggregation policy, will essentially return none because there's too few customers in that group. In this case, because the query was much more sensitive, the privacy rules weren't able to return any information at all, whereas differential privacy was, you know, while it's noisy, differential privacy was able to re return um, some results and help the data consumer understand at least ballpark what the result is. So we can see this kind of pattern uh, on a larger scale if I run a larger query. So uh, let's consider the query, you know, what's the total number of units shipped by product by month? So what I've done is I've calculated this for a subset of the products in my data set. And again, I've split them out by month. I've plotted the two results with differential privacy and then with, differential pri with privacy rules. And what I've done is I've created a sort of a heat map where the color of the cell denotes how much noise is in the answer. So I'll zoom into this in a second. But if you'll notice, comparing these two side by side, is that the differential, the table produced by differential privacy, there is some color in these cells, right? There is some noise included in each cell. There are some cells where they're very close to white or basically white. Um, so there's very low noise in these results. However, if we move over to the results with privacy rules, what we'll notice is that the results are either black or white. Either there is a result and it is the exact result without noise or it is black because I can't return a result and that's considered to be basically infinite noise, right? The lack of a result, I can't give information, that's essentially the same thing as giving infinite noise. So I'll zoom in a little bit just so you can see this a little bit better. Um, what we're seeing here is that there are a couple products that probably have fewer customers delivering them and so the, the amount of noise is higher, right? So for example, moon pies, oatmeal cream pies, whoopie pies, there's fewer customers delivering these. On the other hand, if we look at something like Oreos, 
every single retailer carries Oreos, right? Everyone is delivering Oreos. There's a lot of customers represented here. We can also see this in the volume of units that are being delivered. Um, and so, as you can also tell, the color of these cells is closer to white, so the amount of noise is lower. If I zoom into the results with the privacy rules, I'll notice kind of the same thing, but I get a lot less information, right? So I'll notice kind of the same trend um, where moon pies and whoopie pies, uh, and actually what I found is Nutter Butters have a very few uh, number of customers delivering these, so we can't return results about these. Uh, there are some months in which case, you know, the, there might be some customers, that there might be more customers delivering these products, and so I can release a result, but in large regard, I can't release any information about these products. So one important thing to keep in mind here is that with privacy rules, this table on the right-hand side here is not private. I wanted to put these side by side and compare and help you visually understand what you can get out of directory privacy versus privacy rules. Um, but we need to keep in mind that if the data provider in this case actually wanted to protect privacy, they would not release the table on the right because it can be used to launch privacy attacks. What I wanted to show with this example is that even though different privacy is adding noise, this is a larger example of how different privacy can still unlock insights in the data um, while still being uh, more private than the privacy rules. So as a last comparison, um, we can look at what happens when uh, I filter down even more granularly. So in this case, what I'm going to do is the same query, but instead of looking across uh, the US, I'm going to filter down to a specific zip code. So in this case, uh, if you'll notice, maybe I can expand this at the same time. If you'll notice, I don't know if you can actually tell with the colors here, but uh, with different privacy, the table is slightly more yellow. So there's slightly more color here because there are fewer customers if we look at this, just one zip code. So each query is slightly more sensitive. However, we'll st we're still getting results in, in each cell. On the other hand, if we look at privacy rules, it's very easy to tell that we can't release any results here, right? And if you recall, this is not because of the aggregation rule. This is actually because of the masking rule. So in this case, with privacy rules, I have no access to geography information, so I can't even run this query, and you can consider that to be infinite noise. All right, so that concludes the demo. I'm gonna switch back over here. So the last thing I'll leave you with is just a call out of the two privacy features that are releasing into preview. So the first one, differential privacy policies, this is coming to public preview soon. This is what we talked about today. So keep an eye out for that. The second one is separate from differential privacy, uh, synthetic data generation. So we didn't talk about this one today, but I wanted to call this out because it is coming to preview soon. So with synthetic data generation, think of it as anonymized versions of sensitive data that can then move, right? So an example use case would be, let's say you have some sensitive production data, you want to move that to different testing and development environments, but you can't move the sensitive data itself. With synthetic data generation, what you'd be able to do is create a anonymized version of this data set that can then move. So the model is a little bit different. You're creating a new version of the data set as opposed to with different privacy, it provides strong privacy and you're opening it up for a query access. So synthetic data generation is going to private preview soon, so also keep an eye out for that. If you're interested in either of these two features, please reach out to your Snowflake contact. And with that, we're finished.